In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We are continuing our series on Samuel. And this particular story, we've been dealing with this one for a while now, but there is so much in this chapter. So much that relates directly to our lives today, despite it being a story that has taken place multiple millennia in the past. And yet it really does speak to human nature and, and to things that we still continue to deal with in our relationship with God today. So Saul was given a direct command by God to go and to slay all of the Amalekites. Don't take any spoil. Don't take their land. Don't take their livestock. Destroy all of them. Everything they are to be wiped off the face of the earth for the sins that they've committed. That was Saul's marching orders. And then Saul gets there and he decides, okay, well, we're going to mostly do that, but we're going to keep all of the nicest livestock, any of the best livestock that you see. You see some really nice looking cattle or sheep. We're going to bring those with us. And uh, also we're going to leave King Agag, the king of the Amalekites. We're going to leave him alive. So we're not going to utterly destroy them the way God told us to. And he and Samuel have had this back and forth that first Samuel denies it, and then he kind of acknowledges that he sinned, but he says, I did it because the people were spurring me on to do this, and I was weak, and I made a mistake. And so uh, Samuel says, okay, now I'm going to have the throne taken away from you, and, and Saul is very upset about this. He says, please, no, don't do this. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And Samuel says, look, basically the die is cast. God has already made his mind up. He's not going to go back on this. The kingdom is going to be taken away from you, Saul. And this is the situation that we find ourselves in right now. So after all of that has happened, all of that has taken place, this is what happens afterward is that it is given to Samuel to set all of this right. And we find this in 1 Samuel 15, verses 32 and 33, which says, Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. So this is Samuel carrying out the execution that Saul should have when he came across Agag if he had been obeying God's commandments. So I think the overarching theme of this verse is pretty obvious. No man escapes God's justice, ever, for any reason. God's justice is coming upon you. Now, sometimes it happens in this life. Sometimes it happens in the next life. In this particular situation, it happens in this life. But even if it doesn't happen here, it's going to happen eventually. God's justice waits for no man. When God is ready to delve it out, it is coming regardless of what anybody wants. And Agag was convinced, based on the context of the scripture. Now, you could translate cheerfully. Oddly enough, and this is just the way the Hebrew language works, you could also translate that into he was brought to him in chains. But either way, whether he was actually cheerful or whether he was just brought to him in bonds, we are given an indication by the, the preceding sentence there that Agag really did believe that he had basically... The, the window of opportunity for him to be killed was gone, and he was convinced that he was going to continue to live. Didn't happen. Samuel was going to set it straight. It fell upon Samuel to correct the mistake of Saul. And so this is something that he took upon himself. You see, when people fail to obey God, God's going to get it done. Now, he may get it done through somebody else, he may get it done through providence, but this is a biblical truth that is true throughout the scripture. One of the best passages, in my opinion, in the book of Esther is when Esther is given this opportunity to go forth and act as the mouthpiece and to try to save the Jews. And you remember that Mordecai, her cousin, that spurs her on to do this, very godly man, he says, salvation is going to come either way. In other words, God's will to save the Jews 
that's going to happen regardless of what you do. But basically, he gives her the choice of, you can be the conduit through which God's will takes place, or you can be an obstacle to it. God's will is going to be done either way. Doesn't matter. And that's really true of us as well. We can choose to either be the one that facilitates God's will being carried out, like Saul, uh, that King Saul actually had the opportunity to do in a very direct way here, or we can choose to oppose him, but God's will is going to be accomplished regardless of what we do. Even if we directly oppose God's will and try to stop it, God's will is going to be accomplished one way or the other. Let's take a, another biblical story with Jonah. Now, God took Jonah and put him back on the right path to Nineveh. But even if Jonah had refused, even if Jonah had refused to the point that God allowed him to die, somebody was going to be preaching to Nineveh. It would have happened one way or the other. And this is a perfect example of that. When Saul refuses to do what God asked him to do, it falls to Samuel. So God's will was still accomplished. It just happened through a different person. And another thing about that is that will we facilitate God's will or oppose it? I mean, obviously that's a big part of it. But I think that it should also convey upon us a, a certain sense of responsibility because, of course, we should want to obey God because it's the right thing to do, because it's what he tells us to do, it's, it's part of our role as Christians. But ultimately, I think we also need to be aware of the fact that if we don't do it, that becomes somebody else's burden to bear. So if nothing other than the love for our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and the other people of God, we need to also want to do the will of God because it lessens their burden. Because somebody else is going to have to take the responsibility of that if we don't. And so, not only to help God's kingdom, but also to ensure that that's not something that somebody else now has to do, because I'm sure that Samuel would have rather not done this. I mean, he was going to do it one way or the other because it's what God wanted to happen, but ultimately, he would have much rather Saul just done what God told him to do than have to deal with all this. We see this later on in the same chapter where Samuel is, is very sorrowful and repentant and upset at what has happened to Saul. And so, at least for our brothers and sisters' sake, we should want to always obey God because that helps them as well. Another lesson, though, that I think that we can take out of this is, do you notice that Samuel is very specific in telling Agag what has happened? Would Samuel have been in the wrong for just right then and there killing Agag and not saying a word? Probably. I don't think there would have been anything technically wrong with that. He wouldn't have been violating a law or anything. But Samuel understood, and I think that this is recorded in the Bible for our benefit as well, that he wanted to make sure that there were no uncertainties in this. He wanted people to know that it wasn't because Agag was an opposing king or a political rival, or he wanted to take their stuff, which Saul actually did with the livestock, and that's part of the reason that God told him to destroy everything, so that wouldn't be something that people accidentally perceived by the conquest here. This was about morality. This is about Agag being a horrible person, a terrible tyrant that murdered people, including children that fell by his own sword, that he had spilled innocent blood for his own ambition, and because of that, he must be punished. It wasn't a personal grudge, it wasn't a vendetta, it wasn't God playing favorites or anything like that. This man did evil and deserved what he got. And Samuel wanted to make that clear for everybody there listening, and for us today as well. A lot of people that are skeptics of the Bible, or people that are scoffers, they'll say that, uh, the Old Testament God is some kind of brutal tyrant that just wants to increase the size of Israel's land or their influence, and they were basically, the Israelites were using this imaginary God they cooked up as an excuse to justify their wars and, and to increase their wealth, increase their power, so on and so forth. Well, if that's the case, then why is it here when we see somebody that they had apparently things that are worth stealing, according to Saul, that God said, nope, destroy all of it. I want a message to be sent here. That the reason this is happening to them, the reason God's wrath is being poured out upon this people, is because they have acted in contradiction to my will. 
They have done that which is evil. They have hurt the innocent. Therefore, I will exact judgment upon them. That is the message that God wanted to send. That is the message that Samuel conveys here when he takes up the responsibility of seeing this punishment delved out to Agag. It wasn't about land, it wasn't about power, it wasn't because of racism or the old god is xenophobic or any of these other ridiculous claims that a lot of the modern skeptics will make here. It was because Agag did wrong, and God being a just God that he is, he had to correct that. And so that's why we see this happening. So ultimately, I think this comes down to how he lived. How we live is important. The choices that we make, that's what matters to God. Not our nationality, not our skill, not our power or wealth or anything like that. What it boils down to is how we live, the choices we make, the way we treat other people, that is what God is primarily concerned with. Agag made bad decisions. And Saul made bad decisions. Which one are we going to be? Are we going to be Agag, somebody that is antagonistic towards God, that does evil and hurts people? Are we going to be Saul that, well, up to this point really hasn't hurt anybody innocent? I mean, that's going to happen later on. But at this point in Saul's story, Saul's just been disobedient. He hasn't really been acting as a stumbling block to God's will, but he also hasn't been doing the things that God asked him to do. So we could be Agag, or we could be Saul, and if Given the choice, I think it'd be better to be Saul. At least we're not acting in open opposition to God's will, in a sense, even though disobedience is acting in opposition to God's will. But in the end, did it really matter to these two? Knowing the end of Saul's story, at the end, did it really matter whether they were openly opposing God or just kind of passively opposing God? Not to God, it didn't. The only person that acts righteously in this story is Samuel, and it's because Samuel has a passion and a desire to make sure to see that God's will is indeed carried out, and then takes the initiative to actually go forth and do it. So out of these three choices, if we're going to be anybody, it's best to be Samuel, the person that actively makes sure that God's will is done and tries to act in accordance to God's will, as opposed to just opposing it or just kind of dismissing it and not really doing what God asks us to do. Samuel is the only one in this story that actually comes out on top. Let's be like him. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.